Now part of the Darkcast Network. Welcome to Indie Podcasts with a Dark Side. In the glitz and glamour of 1922 Hollywood, a beautiful showgirl unleashed a brutal attack against a 19-year-old who she believed was having an affair with her husband. This case gave her the nickname, the Tiger Woman. It's the case of Clara Phillips, right now, on Love and Murder. Welcome, lambs. Welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder, your weekly true crime podcast telling you cases of heartbreak that turn to homicide. I am your host, Kai, and in today's episode, we're discussing a case of a really beautiful psychopath, I guess. You'll see what I mean when I get into it. Before we begin, I want to remind you that this episode, and I don't know why I said it like that, this episode is sponsored by my lambs and Patreon, patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Be sure to subscribe to Love and Murder right now while you're listening so you don't miss a case. And if you didn't know, you can also subscribe on our Patreon so that you don't have to hear intros or commercials and you'll get high rants, bonuses, and you'll be a sponsor of Love and Murder. Patreon.com forward slash love and murder. In the meantime, though, grab your butts, grab your BJ's apple juice, murderandlove.com forward slash BJ's. And let's get into some Love and Murder. Born in Waco, Texas on June 23rd, 1898, Clara Ann Weaver's childhood was a whirlwind. Part of a large family, she was one of five, they moved frequently across the state before settling in Houston when she was a teenager. Despite the constant change, Clara harbored a burning ambition to become a star. Her teenage years were filled with dreams of the silver screen and a world far removed from the dusty plains of Texas. Houston ended up offering her a taste of the city life, which isn't saying much if you've been to like a city city like New York City or Philly, but I guess it's the 1800s, so I guess that's a big city back then. Also, side note. No offense to my H-Town listeners, as this is totally not a dig at you, but I know you know what I'm talking about. I lived in Houston at one point, and between Houston and NYC and Philly, Houston isn't really city city. It's like suburb type city. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, back to the show. And it was in Houston that Clara met a young man named Armour Phillips. Armour, who was rumored to be a distant relative of the wealthy Mellon family. Now, the Mellon family were a Pittsburgh-based banking and oil dynasty family, so they came from money, money. And this promised Clara a life of luxury, like stuff like what she dreamed about, you know? So they ended up marrying young on November 13th, 1913, when she was just 15. And look... Don't start looking at me sideways because that's how it was back then. So just look, it's the 1800s. And when they got married, well, they got married because they were both driven by their desires. So Clara wanted to get to Hollywood and Armour wanted success in the oil industry. So with both of them having their goals and both of their goals leading them more to the California lifestyle, they packed their bags and headed west and moved from Texas to Vermont Square neighborhood in Los Angeles, California. Clara ended up being relatively successful in her acting career. She worked as a chorus girl at the Pentages Theater in Hollywood and as a model for Max Sennett in one of his Senate Bathe in Beauties works. Armour found quick success in the oil business and ended up showering Clara with the finer things in life. They moved into a luxurious home, frequented exclusive clubs, and Clara, now known as Clara Phillips, finally thought that she'd made it. Now, at this point, I want to note two things. Number one, that there were people in Clara's family who were very violent, and Clara herself had been known to be very manipulative including one time when she made up a story about being kidnapped when she was a child. In LA, she got into a lot of fights with other showgirls, and she also fought with her husband, but she was still very, very devoted to him. 
The second thing I wanted to bring up is, although they were living this luxurious lifestyle, like I said, there were cracks that started to form. And that's because Armour was giving her this life, but she didn't know that it was all on credit. He bought the house on credit and everything he bought for her was on credit. So they were actually about to have some financial issues. Also, Armour's long hours at work turned into unexplained absences. And back in the early 1900s, which much hasn't changed now, unexplained absences of husbands turned into whispers among neighbors. And I mean, truthfully, you could literally just mind your own business, but I guess, you know, you had nothing else to do, no TV to watch. So I guess minding other people's business is what you did for fun. I don't know. And so rumors started flying and you know how rumors are. Oh my God, he didn't come home from work. He must be with somebody else. Or, oh my God, somebody pulled up into her driveway. She must be doing something. Rumors. However, in these rumors, one specific name kept coming up. Alberta Gibson Tremaine Meadows. Alberta was a 19-year-old bank teller. And she was completely like the opposite of Clara. In Clara's eyes, Alberta seemed to have everything that she wanted. Born in 1903, she came from a quiet Midwestern town and then moved to L.A. She was described as a natural beauty with a gentle demeanor. However, in other publications, I saw it describe her as mousy. So, I don't know. They, they described Clara as a beauty and they described her as mousy. So let's just split the difference and say she looked regular. I don't know. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder because even for Clara, when you'll see what I'm talking about her beauty later on in the episode. But even for Clara and how they are exaggerating her beauty, when I look at the picture, she just looks like a regular woman to me. She's nobody that I would do. A, oh, oh, oh my God, look at her. Like so as as opposed to Alberta who may be gorgeous, but then they describe her as mousy. So beauty for anybody is in the eye of the beholder. Alberta had recently become a widow, and then she took this job as a bank teller to support herself because she no longer had a husband to do that. People, it's the early 1900s. Once again, don't get on me. So finding out about Alberta, well, I want to say loosely, finding out, air quotes, about Alberta sent Clara into a jealous rage. Clara decided that she was Inspector Gadget and she was about to start investigating these rumors. So she started stalking Armour and Alberta. She followed Armour to the First National Bank, which she found out this is where Alberta worked. So this, seeing this, I mean, he's going to the bank, he has a business and he goes to the bank and Alberta just happens to work there, led her to assume the rumors were true. I mean, what else could you assume that he was going to deposit money into the bank and she just happened to work there? Ah, no, they have to be sleeping together. So this part is kind of shaky because it's surmised. People don't really know if this happened or not, but she could have questioned people who knew Alberta. She could have followed her home, questioned the neighbors, questioned other coworkers, stuff like that. That part is kind of shaky, so I'm not putting it in hard fact and saying this is what happened. Whenever I find out something that isn't hard fact, I let y'all know. So, or if I'm making something up, I let y'all know. I don't ever want you to think that something that isn't definitely part of the case is part of the case. So it's surmised that she might have, quote, investigated Alberta even more, but it is not set in stone. However, what is set in stone is that on July 10th, 1922, she went to a five and dime store, a five and dime store, y'all, and bought a 15 cent claw hammer, 15 cents. She then asked the store clerk if this could kill a woman. And, you know, the clerk thought she was joking, which any rational person would think you're joking. And she replied with, quote, yes, if you hit her hard enough with it, I suppose. So Clara said, sold. Here's your 15 cents for this claw hammer that in 2024 will probably cost me $45. And the next day, Clara, then accompanied by her friend, Peggy Caffey, broke into Alberta's home only to find that she wasn't there. I mean, how rude, am I right? 
So she wasn't there. Then they went back to her job at the first national bank. And that's where they saw her. So, you know, it's during the day. So where else would she be? But once Clara saw her there, so she started to pretend like she was drunk. And when Alberta came out, she saw Clara there. She was like, oh, Miss Phillips, um, is everything okay? And Clara's like, I'm so drunk. I'm so drunk. Oh, I'm so drunk. Please, I need you to drive me to Monte, Monte, C, Monte Cito Heights. Yeah, I need you. I need you to drive me and my friend here, Peggy, who I, who I love so much. I need you to drive me to Monte Cito Heights. So that's my interpretation of being drunk. So when they got to Monte Cito Heights, suddenly Clara wasn't so drunk anymore. So Alberta's like, uh, Miss Phillips, is everything okay? What's going on? And Clara was like, well, what's going on, Alberta, is what you doing with my husband? What you have going on with Armour? And Alberta was like, nothing. I mean, he comes into the bank, puts his money in the bank and leaves. I mean, I say hi, I ask him how he's doing, how's his day going? And Clara was having none of that. She was like, no, you're doing something with my husband. I know it is. And everybody's saying that you're doing it. And so because everybody says it, it has to be true. And Alberta was like, no, I'm telling you, I, I only see him when he comes into the bank to do banking stuff because I'm his bank teller and that's my job. So Clara was like, you're clearly a liar and started hitting Alberta in the head with that claw hammer. She hit her 50 times. And then as if that was not enough, she rolled a 50 pound boulder over the body, then got in her car and drove home. Y'all, Peggy was right there and saw this whole thing. She sat there and watched this whole thing happen. But after that crazy bitch did this shit, she didn't say nothing. She was like, look, look, look. I know Kai said that she sings like a bird, but I just witnessed the most craziest crap I've ever seen in my life. And I'm, no, I'm not doing that. So she just shut up, didn't tell anybody what happened. And was probably just looking out her window for whenever Clara was coming for her. I mean, can you imagine just sitting there doing your job and some woman just suddenly starts accusing you of, of having an affair with their husband and they won't hear reason. And so they beat you 50 times with a claw hammer. So when she got home, still drenched in Alberta's blood. So imagine that sight. She just walks through the door. Honey, I'm home. And has blood just dripping down her face and her clothes and everything like that. Armor's sitting there looking at her like, what the, did you, did you go hunting today? I, what's going on? So she informed him about the murder and told him, quote, quote, darling, I have killed the one you love most in this world. Now I'm going to cook you the best supper you ever had. End quote. That's what she said while she was dripping blood. And so what do you think Armour's going to say? He was like, um, okay. And trying to figure out how he's going to get out of this. But shockingly, he helped Clara get rid of the evidence. And then he helped her leave Los Angeles. Then after sending her away on the train to El Paso, the, this is the next morning. He got her on the train. She went to Texas and he got on the phone and called his lawyer like you do. Exactly. You play it cool while the crazy psycho murderer is in front of you. And as soon as they're out of your face, you call the police. But anyway, I guess he did the next best thing and called his lawyer. And then he called the police and told them about the murder. So investigators went out and when they found the body, they literally said her injuries look like a tiger attacked her. That's how horribly beat up and cut up she was. Because remember, it was a claw hammer. So they said it looked like a tiger had mauled this poor woman. And so when it came out to the press, that's when they started calling Clara the tiger woman. So on July 14th, Clara was arrested in Tucson, Arizona. Now for a quick commercial break and a deeper dive into Love and Murder with the Love and Murder Supporters Club. Join us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash love and murder, 
or Spotify or Spreaker. And easy access to the links are in the show notes below. As a Lamb supporter, you get episodes free of intros and commercials so you don't get this. Like I cut this part out to put it into Patreon and all the other commercials that come out, you don't get that. Plus you get bonus episodes, you get Kai Rants and so much more. For our Patreon subs, you get extra perks like case extras and more bonus episodes because I might do a reaction video and the only place I could post videos is in my Patreon. So be a supporter of Love and Murder. You can do it on patreon.com forward slash love and murder. The donation there starts at only $3 a month. You could also do it on Spotify or Spreaker, whatever platform catches your fancy. Come on over and be a lamb supporter. You'll be happy that you did. Another quick thing I want to remind you about is another way to support Love and Murder is by simply joining BJ's. So if you're looking to save money doing your grocery shopping, which I know everybody is, then join BJ's today and join in through my link, murderandlove.com forward slash BJ's. You save $25 off of your yearly membership for the first year. I'm telling you, I'm serious. I'm serious. I don't give y'all stuff that I don't do myself. I joined BJ's just to test it out and I have been a member for the past year. Actually, my membership for the third year is about to expire and I'm about to renew it. I am telling you, BJ saves me so much time, so much money. I could literally record an episode right now, go online, shop, hit pick up at store and I can either go to the store and they'll load a cart and give it to me or they'll bring it out to my car. Literally grocery shopping in like five minutes. You don't even have to go in the store. Plus what I buy with my little family, it lasts us like a whole month because of how big everything is. You won't be sorry. At least give it a try for the first year, just like I did. Murderandlove.com forward slash BJ's. If you do it through my link, you'll get the $25 off your first year's membership. Plus you'll be supporting Love and Murder. Murderandlove.com forward slash BJ's. And now back to the show. So remember, this is the early 1900s and this crazy murder just happened. So can you imagine the media frenzy that's going on right now? They didn't have TV. They didn't have social media. They didn't have podcasts. They had this and just the media took it and ran, which actually nothing's really changed in that arena. I mean, I do do a true crime podcast, so... Anyways, newspapers plastered photos of Alberta, the victim, and the beautiful, enigmatic, gorgeous Clara Phillips across their front pages. You'll understand why I'm using all these adjectives. Clara herself stayed quiet about the murder. She said, I'm not saying nothing to nobody, no how, even though didn't you bring your friend with you and she witnessed the whole thing? You brought her with you to buy the hammer and then... You took her with you to see the girl and then you beat the girl in front of her. So why are you suddenly quiet? And then you went home, literally covered in the evidence and then told your husband what you did. And then he helped you hide the murder weapon. So what's the point of you being quiet right now? Anyway, so she decided she's not going to say anything. But either way, whether she was silent or not, the trial, which began on September 17th, 1922, became an even bigger spectacle. Now this went nationwide. People have stuff to talk about now. Armour hired an attorney for his wife, which, why? But Bert Harrington was Clara's attorney and the prosecution had Charles Frick as their attorney. Now in this trial, they're going to use Clara's beauty for and against her. So while some were seeing her as a ruthless killer, Others were completely captivated by how she looked, leading some of them to believe that she was completely incapable of violence because beautiful people are incapable of doing anything wrong. Like literally, I guess that should have been their entire defense. I mean, your honor, seriously, there are multiple witnesses and she said it of her own mouth, but seriously, look at her. Um, Look at her. I rest my case, your honor. But in reality, you think I'm playing It was exactly just like I said. Attorney Burt capitalized, you're listening to me, capitalized on her beauty and the city's perception of Clara. 
and he portrayed Clara as a loving wife driven to temporary insanity by jealous rage because how beautiful she was. She was just home being beautiful for her husband and he was out with Alberta doing their banking. I, I don't know. Her lawyers argued that circumstantial evidence was flimsy and that the true perpetrator remained unidentified. I mean, I think their definition of circumstantial evidence is completely different than the rest of the world. Having a witness, confessing to your husband, showing up covered in evidence. I, I don't I don't know what what part of that is circumstantial, but hey, okay. As long as she's pretty, right? Look at this pretty woman here. She couldn't have done it. Circumstantial. I don't know. The prosecution, however, painted a completely different picture. They meticulously presented evidence as they should have, including the hammer purchase, which all they had to do was go down to the store and say, hey, have you seen this woman? When was she here? Because I guess if she's so strikingly beautiful, then everybody would remember seeing her. When was she here? Please give me the receipt. They look in their book because, you know, they don't have cash registers back then. They look in their book. They said, oh, yeah, she bought a 15 cents claw hammer on this day, which was literally the day before the murder. Then they got witnesses who placed Clara near the crime scene. And then they brought Peggy up to testify about how Clara murdered Alberta right dead schmackety schmack in front of her. So Clara's attorney got an idea. Bing! and instead implicated Peggy in the murder. Uh, Your Honor, did I say unidentified? No, what I meant was that Peggy did it. I mean, look at that face. She is so plain and homely. She could totally randomly murder someone for no reason whatsoever. Right? Right? I'm a lawyer. The prosecution ignored him and then continued on with countering his claims of temporary insanity for his client. They said this wasn't temporary insanity. This was cold and calculated and brutal attack of Alberta. The prosecution also downplayed Clara's beauty, focusing on the cold bloodedness of the crime only. So basically, like any rational person would. Stop staring at the cold-blooded killer and remember that they are a cold-blooded killer. Yes, I'm talking to you, those of you who are falling for Ted Bundy after the Netflix movie. At one point, Clara dropped her I'm so pretty facade and yelled at Peggy while she was on the stand. Oh, really? Can a pretty girl yell? Or does she just sit there and be like a lady? Pretending like I'm in the 1900s, y'all. 1900s, not now. Don't come for me. So the prosecution did their job because on November 16th, 1922, Clara was convicted of second degree murder and was sentenced to 10 years to life in prison. Now, she didn't get life because she was hot. True story, y'all. Y'all think I'm playing when I'm saying this. I'm trying to make jokes. True story. Quote, three women jurors wanted to see her hang, but compromised on second degree murder. End quote. Because the male jurors thought she was pretty. True story, y'all. Makes no sense at all. I know y'all thought I was making jokes all through this thing, but I'm serious. This is literally documented what happened. So Clara went to jail and on December 5th, 1922, during a routine jail inspection, Clara's cell was empty. The bars were sawed through in the window frame and the window was left open. So literally she took a saw from where? Sawed through the window, the uh, bars in the window frame, which who didn't hear that noise? It was a saw sawing through metal. Who didn't hear that noise and then opened the window and jumped out the window and disappeared into the night. So police started a manhunt for her. And the first person they questioned was Armour, who said, I have no idea where she is. I seriously, last I saw her, she was being hauled off to jail. And so they asked her two sisters, Ola Weaver and Etta Mae Jackson. And they said, we had nothing to do with this. Our dad just left the night before to go to a downtown hotel. I don't know, maybe ask him, but... We have nothing to do with this. So the police started thinking and they're like, well, if I was a gorgeous, 
beautiful, absolutely stunning woman who was convicted of murder, where would I go? And they figured out that she went to Mexico. And so they sent information to the police down there. In April of 1923, police in El Salvador spotted Clara. And on April 23rd, she was arrest. She was arrested in, I don't even know how to say that, but she was arrested in Honduras. I don't know how to say the city. T-E-G-U-C-I-G-A-L-P-A. If somebody wants to phonetically write that out for me, that will be great. So she was arrested in Honduras and so were her accomplices, Etta May, her sister, who initially said she had nothing to do with it, and Jesse Carson, a journalist who had covered her trial. Now, when she was walking out after she was arrested and she was walking out of the courthouse, he had whispered to her that he was going to get her out and somebody overheard it and thought he was playing. I'm telling you, there's nobody that good looking to me. There, no, absolutely not. Anyways, I guess he wasn't playing. He wanted that gorgeous woman out of jail because she's just too pretty to be put behind bars. I don't know. So he got her a saw, I guess. Now, on top of that, while she was jailed in Honduras, she convinced a crowd of 15 teenage boys to help her escape. But a warden heard them and arrested the boys. Look, I, I'm telling you, for real, for real. I know I said this already, but for real, for real. There is nobody in that I can think of that I've seen, and I've seen some good-looking people. There is nobody that I can think of. Let me tell you, I have seen such a good-looking guy in my face, not even on TV, in my face at one of my jobs, when I was younger, I was in my early 20s and I was working as a cash register and this guy came in and oh my God, if I don't tell you how gorgeous this man was, I couldn't even look at him. Like if I had looked at him, I was leaving the store with him. So to keep myself together, I didn't even look at him. And then out of all the registers, he comes to my register so look at me just with my head down, helping him out, taking his money, giving him his change back. And he stood in front of me, staring at me for a while. And I kept looking down at the desk. And then after a while, he walked out. That's how good looking he was. I am not, I wish I could have given y'all a picture. It, he had to have been like a freaking model. I'm not exaggerating. And to prove I'm not exaggerating, when he walked out, all the rest of the cashiers ran over to me and was like, Oh my God, Kai, are you serious? Why didn't you talk to him? Oh my God, he was so hot. He clearly wanted to talk to you. Oh, look, that's how hot he was. I'm not exaggerating. And if I were to find out that he murdered somebody, dude, you are not that hot. Absolutely not. You just, you just a psychopath behind bars. Still not that hot. <laughs> So that's what I'm saying. There's nobody in the history of what I know from what I've ever seen that's hot enough for me to A, say you're not guilty of something that you clearly did and B, now I'm going to commit a felony to help you out so you can be hot in the world. No, absolutely not. So early in the morning of May 2nd, 1923, Clara was transferred to Omoa Castle, and then on May 26, she was brought back to Los Angeles. During the investigation to see how she escaped, it was discovered, like I said, that Clara had used Jesse to get a saw, which she then used to cut the bars. And then this part is weird. She was lifted from the jail by Jesse and two other men onto the roof of the jail. And then they drove her away, whatever. And then that's when her and Jesse spent five weeks in Los Angeles. And then from Los Angeles, they traveled to Texas and then to Louisiana. And then they went into Mexico. And that's where they met Etta. So that whole from the roof to the car part, it, that part is like, what? That part didn't make sense to me, but that's what they said. So anyway, now she's back in prison and she decided she didn't want to be there anymore. So she attempted to commit suicide by slitting her wrists. But they saved her, so it wasn't able to go through. And so then she had to learn her lesson and stay in prison because you don't get everything you want. So then she thought, okay, well, 
fine, then I'll just be a good prisoner and work towards early release. In 1926, she was allowed to temporarily leave to see her dying mother, and then they brought her back. While she was in prison, she studied to become a dental assistant, and she met a convicted burglar named Thomas Price. Then in 1929, she asked Governor C.C. Young to release her so that she can come home to be a good little housewife. But Governor Young said no. Then in 1931, she did an interview with the L.A. Times and said that she didn't care that she killed Alberta. Quote, I fought with Alberta on top of Montecito Drive to protest the only love I have ever known. Armor L. Phillips is my baby. He has been my only baby. He is my very life. And when I realized he was being taken from me, I fought, fought, fought so that I might always have him. End quote. This was what she said. In September of 1932, a correctional officer intercepted a love letter between Alberta and her convicted burglar, Thomas. So now she's writing love letters to somebody in prison. So when they got this, they stripped her of her visitation rights, stripped her of her mail rights, stripped her of her library rights, as well as her parole that she was going for in 1933 was denied and 1934 was denied. And this was all due to the letters. Not the fact that she clearly said that she holds no remorse just because she's writing some dude. That's why you denied her parole. Not the fact that she has no remorse for murdering another woman, but because she was writing a dude. The priorities back in the early 1900s. Then in June 17th, 1935, she was released from prison and told everyone that her plans was to become a quote, useful citizen and a model housewife. He stayed with her, y'all. He stayed with her. Oh, she showed up bloody at the house, said, I murdered this woman for you. He got lawyers for her. Well, he turned her into the police. Then he hired lawyers for her. Then he stayed with her the whole 12 years she was in prison. He stayed with her and she's right in a convicted burglar while she's married. So I guess that's, that was the, that was the, the, the line in the sand that they were not, you know, they were not crossing. You're married and you're riding some other man that no shame on you. That's not what a good housewife does. That's why they kept her in prison. He stayed with her. So she got out in 1935 and by 1938, they got divorced. You stayed with her for 12 years, sir. Knowing that she was a murderer and a psycho, you stayed with her. I I just, I can't get over that. After this, she told reporters that she was going to go to San Diego to work as a dental assistant. And later on, she asked the court for permission to move from Los Angeles to Texas. Now, as soon as she moved to Texas, she basically fell off the map. So not much is known about her life after that, other than she did change her name. And in 1961, somebody did spot her in Texas. And that's it. That is a crazy case of Clara Phillips, the supposedly too beautiful for murder woman. Now, it's important to remember that even now, your attractiveness can affect how people see you in any type of life. Even if you're a convicted murderer and you're going, you're in trial, it still affects that to this day. That is something that has been researched. And I'm fascinated by that because there's no way in my head, in my rational head, there's no way, but it's something that happens even today. So what do you think about that case? Let me know what you have to say in the comments below. Also, let me know in the poll question, have you ever done something stupid that you may be later regretted because you thought someone was so hot. Now it doesn't have to do with murder or trial, or anything, just anything that you did that you thought was stupid that you later regretted because you thought someone was so hot. Now, if I get more no's than yeses, I'm calling y'all liars, liars, because you know, you've done some crazy crap to get the attention of your crush. You know it. Now me, I'll tell you what I did. The craziest thing I did was my little tomboy butt, Kai, who doesn't wear heels and none of that stuff. I tried to dress up. (laughs) I tried to dress up in three inch, three inch to go from no heels to three inch 
platform heels to be cute for my crush back in my younger days. Well, as you can figure, I almost ended up breaking my ankle right in front of his face too. And the embarrassment almost killed me. Yeah, I was really embarrassed and it takes a lot to make me embarrassed. So that's the craziest thing that I've done for somebody that I thought was hot. But in my defense, he later married me. So I guess it worked out. I don't know. <laughs> so you would tell me in the poll question, have you done something stupid for somebody you thought was hot and you later regretted it? So just yes or no. And speaking of poll questions... In last week's episode, we talked about the case of Francis Newton and the poll question was based on the evidence given on the episode. Do you think Francis was innocent or guilty? And only two people answered this poll. So I can't, I mean, it was a split vote. 50% said guilty. So I guess one person said guilty. One person said innocent. So I can't really say, but let's see what the comments said. Christina Bobo said she should have been granted a retrial. So she's in innocent. So I guess most of y'all thought she was innocent then. She should have been granted a retrial at the very least. Ineffective counsel, mishandling of evidence, lack of evidence being processed, even jury members requesting a new and fair trial. I really don't know, but my heart says she was innocent. Seems like they just wanted a slam dunk here and didn't even pursue alternative suspects. My heart hurts for her because she lost her family and was punished for it and ultimately lost her life at the hands of the state. That's literally exactly how I felt. Based on what I read and based on all the evidence I went through, it didn't specifically state that she did it. There was there was more evidence saying that she wasn't even around the area than it was to prove that she did it. And I felt like nobody did their due diligence in this in this case. And that's literally how I feel. Christina goes on to say, there was more that proved her innocence than guilt. And in criminal law, they did not prove her guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Her attorney wasn't even supposed to be practicing. Yes, exactly. She goes on. Yes, this one has me in my feelings for sure. Thanks for bringing attention to her story. Maybe someone will hear it and a posthumous pardon or something could be done. It won't bring her back, but at least clear her name and maybe open up the gate for any surviving families to sue the state or maybe save someone else from meeting the same fate. Maybe a law can be made to make mandatory retrials when certain conditions are realized post conviction. Just thinking out loud, I'm not a lawyer. And that's, that's literally, I, I agree. I agree with that. Maybe something can be done. Maybe somebody heard this episode. I don't know. And something can be done. And then I have an email and I'll read part of the email from Colleen C. I really enjoyed listening to your episodes, especially with your grab your apple juice. There's a whole story behind that. Like if you go back to the very beginning Char would always say, you know, she's grabbing some alcohol, her wine or something. I literally don't drink alcohol. So I would always dissuade her from grabbing alcohol. I'd be like, well, no, let's just grab apple juice because I love apple juice. So that's where the grab your apple juice came from. And then grab your butts is something from um, Jurassic Park. And I kind of speak movie So I just drop movie lines in wherever. So grab your apple juice, grab your butts. That's how that came about. She goes on to say, please take care of yourself. I am more than fine with biweekly full episodes, even once a month. I can't imagine all the work you really have to do to prepare for an episode. Yeah, (laughs) I'm going to do it because I love my lambs and I I love love and murder and I love talking to y'all. So I'm going to keep doing it. Um, We came to a resolution on how we're going to do it. But thank you so much for understanding. She goes on to say, you are doing an awesome job and you really make my day. I am in law enforcement. And so, yes, I understand a lot of where you come from. I'm so happy you understand. (laughs) I know you can't kick down doors like I say I would, but I'm so happy you understand. She goes on, believe me, there are plenty of times I wish some things I could do differently, but I am doing my part to avoid making these dumb mistakes of not doing enough for the victims. And I completely understand, Colleen, and I'm so happy that, you know, you're one of the people who are doing your due diligence and you won't be like me and kick down doors and find yourself in prison just like me who can't help. I won't be able to help anybody else because I just lost my temper for one person. 
So I'm happy that you're able to keep it together so that you can continue helping multiple people and bringing these jerks to justice like they need to be brought to justice. So thank you for reaching out, Colleen, and thank you so much for being a lamb. And so that is all that I have for you today. Be sure you share this episode. That is one way that you can help love and murder for free. So just go ahead and hit that share icon, share on your social media, share on your Twitter. If anybody uses Twitter still, share on your Facebook, share on your Instagram, share on your TikTok, share with your friends in WhatsApp, share, 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 share. And as always, I end each episode by reminding you that it's, say it with me now, all love and no murder, y'all. See you in the next episode. Bye. The Missing Magnolias podcast tells the stories of the missing and murdered. Ultimately, these kids went into state custody and they never came out. Together with missing persons expert, Dr. Michelle Shanice, we uncover the real true crime experience. Every time we do another interview, I'm like, how do we find so many badass women? We hear from victims who turn their pain into something positive. We didn't find out till we were 11 or 12 years old that our mom was murdered. In Times Square, it said Mickey Shunick fought for her life and experts who think outside the box to solve cases. I scour missing persons databases like NamUs to see if they're uploaded to that database. Subscribe.